After 580 days in jail, Brazil's former president and leader of the left, Lula da Silva, walks free, a day that could change the future direction of the country. Indigenous leaders condemn political persecution in Ecuador and hopes for peace in South Sudan are still alive as a deadline for national unity is pushed back. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Stefania Bravo and this is From the South. An extraordinary day in Brazil as former President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva walked out of the police building in Curitiba, a free man. After a year and a half behind the bars, Lula took his first steps to freedom and it was much to the delight of hundreds of supporters gathered outside the building, carrying signs reading Free Lula and chanting the same message. Lula's release comes less than a day after Brazil's Supreme Court ruled that a person can be imprisoned only after all the appeals have been exhausted. Following, following his release, Lula's attorney vowed to continue the judicial battle towards getting the corruption case against the former president nullified. The 74-year-old, who remains a huge symbol for many in his country, addressed supporters after he walked free from jail. <laughs> I never thought that today I could be here talking to men and women who for 580 days were here shouting good morning Lula, shouting good afternoon Lula, shouting good night Lula. No matter if it was raining, no matter if the temperature was 40 degrees or if it was zero degrees, every day you were the lifeblood of democracy that I needed to resist. In these days of disgraceful behavior by the rotten parts of the Brazilian state towards me and towards all of Brazilian society, the rotten part of the justice system, the rotten part of the public prosecutor's office, the rotten part of the federal police, who worked so hard to criminalize the left, criminalize the Workers' Party, and criminalize Lula. On a happier note, Lula announced to the crowds that he is planning to remarry. I want to present my future partner. I had the great luck while a prisoner to find a girlfriend and even to succeed in having her accept me. That was very brave of her. Joining us live from Sao Paulo is our correspondent Brian Muir. Hi Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, just remind us what has just happened and what this means. Well, Lula had been held in solitary confinement for 580 days in violation of the Mandela rights, in violation of international law. He had his candidacy illegally barred from last year's presidential election, which directly resulted in the election of a neo-fascist, Jair Bolsonaro, who's dismantled all of the environmental protection in the country. So we see the Amazon's on fire, the largest oil spill in Brazilian history underway. And basically what the Supreme Court said last night is that for the last 580 days, Lula has been held in violation of the Brazilian constitution, not just Lula, but all 5,000 roughly prisoners in Brazil who have been arrested after their appeals process plays out because the 1988 constitution makes it very clear that any Brazilian citizen is innocent until proven guilty. And so even though there was some maneuvering last April in order to uh, enable them to arrest Lula, the Supreme Court has reversed their earlier decision and declared it unconstitutional. And, and basically, they announced that every moment forward from last night that Lula was behind bars, it, the courts were committing a crime. So he's free now, and he's announced that he's planning on uh, traveling across the country and working on rebuilding the base of the Brazilian left in opposition to neo-fascist President Jair Bolsonaro.
Now, Brian, what does this um, what does this mean for Brazil and for all Latin America? What does this mean, for example, that he is uh, out of prison and, and that he's a free man after a year and a half? Brian, can you hear me? We will get back to Brian with more, but now let's go to Curitiba, where independent journalist Mike Fox is. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Could you describe us uh, how the mood is like there where you are? We'll get back to Mike as soon as we can. Let's go to a break now. Join us again in a minute. A review of the world news that investigates, incites analysis and induces criticism, because every event has a context. Pusimos el punto de ahí. Dot in the eye. Saturdays. Only on the best world. Welcome back to From the South. And let's go to Curitiba now, where independent journalist Mike Fox has been with Lula supporters outside as Lula walked out of the police station where he was being held. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for, for joining us. So you're in Curitiba now. Could you describe the mood there when Lula came out? It was massive. You know, these people have been waiting uh, for a year and a half, 580 days for Lula to be freed. Uh, many of them dropped everything uh, and moved to Curitiba, first to Sao Paulo, where Lula kind of held out in defense uh, when they said he should turn himself in to, to go to prison, and then traveled uh, to Curitiba and started the vigil here, and many of them have stayed in this vigil. I've been interviewing people all day long. Um, one person, uh, two people from, from southern Brazil found their wives at the, uh, at the vigil here outside of the federal prison, and, and one man has now has a little girl with someone who he met at the vigil. It, it has changed people's lives, and this organizing and the fight, and so to see Lula walk out of there, this thing that they've been just wanting for so long, and you know, as Brian talked about too, Lula is a historic figure uh, in Brazil. He's the most revered president, and he should have won last year if he wasn't blocked from running uh, because of this the charge and the jailing. So people were just ecstatic. It was um, extremely powerful. Lula walked out. He walked through the crowd, walked up to the stage, uh, and he gave a, a short speech. Uh, of course, people crying, people chanting, uh, and many people in the crowd saying that uh, that this is a, this is a, this is a first step. This is a first step. It's a good first step. It doesn't, uh, you know, having Lula out is 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 the most important first step. Um, but uh, but it it, it kind of gives them hope about the possibilities of Brazilian democracy. Now, Mike, what is what is currently happening now there in Curitiba? Uh, where is Lula, and what will he be doing next? <clears throat> so Lula is headed home to Sao Paulo tonight, San Bernardo do Campo, um, and he's going to be holding a big rally tomorrow in San Bernardo do Campo, uh, which is, of course, where he got his kind of political start. You know, that's where his union, the ABC Metal Workers Union, that's where that's located, and that's also the the place that he kind of holed up into. Uh, where they kind of defended the building and uh, his supporters came down from around the country to, to block the police from taking him for several days uh, when he had first been uh, asked to go to jail. And so it's, it's kind of coming full circle in a lot of ways. So he's going to be holding a very large rally there tomorrow. He spoke for about 20 minutes today. We're expecting him to speak for longer tomorrow. Um, here at the, at the, at the Lula Vigil,
sexual. It's it. Your question is a very good question. You know, a lot of people. It's kind of bittersweet. Uh, like I said, many people moved here. They 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 picked up their lives. And now, what does that mean? Now that Lula has been freed, what does it mean for the vigils? Uh, I think people are still trying to to figure out the next steps. Many people I talk to uh, have talked about. You know, they they've created lives here in Curitiba and. Um, and, and they're expecting to stay. Other people might be might be moving on, and other people are are, are going to follow Lula and Sao Paulo. They they want to carry on the fight. Um, so uh, you know, again, this has been it's 580 days it's been since April 7th of last year when you know I was here when the helicopter Lula's helicopter arrived and federal police started firing tear gas at Lula supporters. So a very very kind of in, you know an intense moment, and to see that come full, full circle and to see. Uh, the excitement of people, uh, it, it really uh, gives everyone hope uh, here in Curitiba and, and, and around the country. Now, Mike, um, in his speech as he came out of a prison, he mentioned that he would be touring uh, Brazil. Do you know where he will be going and what will he be doing? It's a good question. I uh, haven't been following that as closely as I would have liked to have been because I've been out interviewing people. Um, I do know that before he went to jail, uh, he was he was doing several caravans around the country. And Lula is very well known for these caravans, which is which have been huge and extremely important. I saw him speak last year in Florianópolis. We did a caravan around the south and then worked the way north. Um, and so uh, it, it's hard to say. Of course, and this the, the caravans with Lula. This goes back to the 1980s and to his his presidential run. This was huge and a huge way of kind of connecting with people. And this shows what kind of a what kind of a person, what kind of an organizer, what kind of a president Lula uh, is and was. And the very first thing he said when he got up on the stage and thanked everyone, uh, you know, from the vigil, they had a, a morning and afternoon and evening chant every single day. Good morning, Lula. Good afternoon, Lula. Good night, Lula. Uh, they did one last final chant with Lula together on the stage this evening. But he thanked people because he said, I could hear it from there. And you guys gave me hope every single day. You guys were my inspiration, democracy, the possibility of democracy in Brazil. Um, and so that idea of really thanking the people for, um, uh, for, for, for continuing the fight. When he went to jail, he had said uh, that right before, in his very last speech from Sambra del Campo, he said that, uh, he was, that though he was going to jail, they were going to create thousands of Lulas. People were going to turn into Lulas everywhere. Uh, in a lot of ways, that's what you've seen. And I think that's part of what the tour that he wants to be doing is to really going back, uh, thanking people and, and kind of getting people inspired around the country uh, and really organizing. I, I would imagine that, that Bolsonaro and his people are, are, are a little nervous. Now, Mike, lastly, in your opinion, what does Lula's release mean for Brazil for, and for Latin America? Well, I, I, I guess I'll defer to what everyone here has been telling me when I've been asking them that question. But I think the very first thing is they say, you know, it's hope. Um, it is a step in the right direction. It is, uh, it is a step toward in the direction of democracy, which is something that so many people are concerned about uh, when you have, uh, you know, the, the Lava Jato and when you have judges who are biased and uh, jailing people. Um, and, and when that's happening, not just here, but all, you know, all around in, in many different countries, when you see the, kind of the push for the far right uh, in Brazil and elsewhere. Um, and so in a lot of ways, Gul is free. You know, he, as many people, not just in Brazil, but around the world, said this was probably one of the, the world's most important political prisoners. Um, and today he has been free. It is important to remember that he's been free, but they have not wiped away the charges against him. And you know, I know Brian spoke to this, um, but that's going to be something that people are going to be fighting for, um, particularly with you know, all the revelations from the Intercept and whatnot showing bias by Judge Sergio Moro and now you know, current Justice Minister. So there's a long fight ahead. Um, but this is a huge victory, a huge victory for kind of grassroots movements, popular movements on the left in Brazil. Mike, we thank you so much for your time for Teresa English. That was independent journalist Mike Fox from Curitiba. Moving on, in the Caribbean, Guyana's opposition leader, Barat Jagdio, is accusing the interim government of trying to disenfranchise voters as the nation prepares for general elections on March 2nd of 2020. It's evident to Guyanese from the dishonesty about the no confidence motion to going to the court to the dishonesty from the president when he keeps making excuses that the constitutional language is not clear 
to their refusal to accept the, the ruling of the court, and even now their dishonest acts at GCOM to try to disenfranchise Ghanaians. That is what the, the, the only group of dishonest people in terms of rigging elections is, are those who sit at Congress place. They sit there and plot how to disenfranchise people or to create trouble with the elections. Meanwhile, President David Granger assures that the government continues to adhere to the convention of a caretaker administration. We have accepted that we are an interim administration. I, for one, apart from my health, I have not traveled to any international conferences you know, for over a year. And, um, and we have not entered into any major agreements. Jamaica has found itself in the middle of a row between China and the United States. All this as Prime Minister Andrew Holmes is in China on a nine-day working visit. Earlier this week, a U.S. military official in Jamaica said China does not share a commitment to democracy and the rule of law that the U.S. shares with the island. The Chinese embassy in Jamaica has responded describing the comment as irresponsible and defamatory. It said its relationship with Jamaica and other countries in the Caribbean has been on the basis of mutual respect and win-win cooperation. In Barbados, the way seems clear for the Myanmar administration to draw down its third installment of 50 million U.S. dollars under a 300 million dollar IMF loan. The money is intended to finance the island's economic recovery and transformation program. Two days ago, we launched the external debt exchange, and that is expected to close um, by the end of this month. And I think that our ability to put behind us the debt restructuring exercise completely allows us to move fully into the next stage of the program, which is literally to complete the structural changes that we have in our regulatory structure to make it easier, not just to do business, but for Barbadians to enjoy services that are delivered to them on a daily basis. And then secondly, for us to focus completely on the projects that are necessary to be able to really do the transformation, um, be it the transformation of our people through the continuous training and the national training initiative over the next four years, or the physical infrastructural projects that are absolutely critical. Complaints of political persecution by the state against citizens, indigenous leaders and opposition politicians are increasing in Ecuador. This comes after October's massive popular protests against the government of Lenin Moreno. Let's take a look. The Pichincha Provincial Court ordered the preventive detention of one of the main leaders of the Citizen Revolution Party, Virgilio Hernández. He's been accused of the alleged crime of rebellion during the national strike. The prosecutor's office says that the evidence presented, which includes phone conversations, cash, and flags of a number of social movements, is enough proof against Hernández. They are looking for vengeance. They want to silence us for being the opposition. That's why we come here with our strength, with conviction, knowing full well we are innocent and we are being persecuted for being the opposition. Indigenous leaders have denounced they're being persecuted as well. Leonidas Issa, the president of Cotopaxi's indigenous and campesino movement and one of the main figures from October's protest, has said he's being accused of the alleged kidnapping of police officers inside Quito's main cultural center. They had not handed over the body of our brother Innocencio Tucumbi. The police officers were not kidnapped. We just wanted them to see what the government had been doing to us. They are trying to use anything against us to intimidate us. For his part, the president of the Quechua People's Confederation of Ecuador, Ecuarunari, rejected the role of the government during the protests. When the people reacted in this way and took to the streets out of necessity, that is when the government started violating human rights. On top of the persecution, there's a case known as the Nine from Sucumbios. It involves the detention of nine people in the Amazonian province of Sucumbios, including three lawmakers and the prefect, for allegedly stopping public services in a water pumping station. These are good people. We know they have no criminal precedents. They haven't done anything illegal. They are just like any other protesters who marched to oppose Decree 883. Over the next few days, international bodies that have been looking into the human rights violations committed during October's protest will provide a report on their findings. Coming up, China slams U.S. Secretary of State for describing the Chinese Communist Party as a threat to international peace and order. Stay with us.
The life is full of moments. Moments of fight. Moments of hope. Moments that transcend. Moments that you can live in. The Lizul documentaries. Sundays. Only on the Lizul. Welcome back to From the South. In Africa, South Sudan's President Salva Kiir and his rival Rick Makar have agreed to push back the date for the formation of a national unity government. The decision follows a long meeting between the rivals in Uganda. Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni, who acted as a mediator, said the two agreed to delay by 100 days to allow them to resolve contentious issues, including the composition of the army. The two former close allies fell out in 2013 after Kiir accused his then Vice President Makar of plotting a coup. This triggered a five-year civil war that has claimed more than 300,000 lives. Benin has implemented a new constitution aimed at calming political tensions that have shook up the country for the past six months. Changes to the electoral law are among the reforms as well as amnesty for offenses that took place during the post-election unrest. Le point the points of innovation revising the constitution concern the abolition of the death penalty, the instituting of general elections with the alignment of all elected mandates, the setting of first general elections in 2026, the public financing of political parties and the naming of an opposition leader. At least 10 soldiers have been killed in northeast Nigeria following an ambush. Another nine were seriously wounded, while 12 remain missing. The attack targeted troops on patrol in Borno State, an area where Boko Haram militants have been active. However, the rival militant group, AMAK, loyal to the Islamic State, has claimed responsibility. But the Nigerian military maintains that Boko Haram were behind the attack. China has slammed U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo for describing the Chinese Communist Party as a threat to international peace and order. The Chinese Foreign Ministry says this was a malicious attempt by Pompeo to drive a wedge between citizens and the Communist Party. Pompeo attempted to cut off the Chinese people from the Communist Party of China and drive a wedge between the Chinese people and the Communist Party of China. I'd like to tell him unequivocally that China's ruling party, the Communist Party of China, has over the nearly 100 years always represented and firmly safeguarded the interests of the Chinese people and has thus won profound trust and heartfelt support from the Chinese people. Attempting to cut off the Chinese people from the Communist Party Party of China is a provocation to the whole Chinese people and it is bound to fail. And we finish in Spain where citizens are set to head to the polls with major parties shifting to the right and Catalan independence high on the agenda before Sunday's general election. Spain will vote for the fourth time in four years as Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez seeks a mandate to form a government. Spanish political rhetoric has become more reactionary as the major parties seek to appease the supporters of the new far-right Vox Party, which has surged to third place nationally. With no party expected to command the necessary majority of 176 in the parliament, Frontrunners Pesoy will need support from another party in order to form a government. After the last election, Podemos sought to provide the votes for a Pesoy-led minority government, but Sanchez's party were unwilling to compromise on ministerial positions for the left-wing movement. As the country prepares to head to the polls, the Spanish foreign minister and top European diplomat-in-waiting, Josep Borrell, is under fire for leaking confidential information pertaining to Scotland-based former Catalan education minister Clara Ponsati. The European Commission criticised Borrell for discussing the European detention order rejected by British authorities. The news comes just days after PM Sanchez was criticised himself for promising to extradite former Catalan President Carles Puigdemont from Belgium in a televised debate 
Despite the supposed existence of judicial independence, the PM said that the Attorney General answers to the government. Yes, also in this matter, I would like to ask you if uh, uh, President-elect von der Leyen or anyone from the, from the European Commission has uh, sp spoken to Mr. Borrell about this affair. I think, again, he tweeted in his capacity as foreign minister, as acting foreign minister of Spain. You are also aware that the tweet has been deleted, and it is now for the Spanish authorities uh, to follow up on, on this matter. Catalonia remains high on the agenda ahead of the vote. The Madrid Assembly, governed by the right-wing parties Pepe, Ciudadanos and Vox, voted to outlaw pro-independence parties in Catalonia and Euskalheria, claiming they're an affront to the unity of Spain. Vox influencing the political debate is worrying, and it's what's happening all across Europe. They push homophobic and anti-migrant agendas. This initiative doesn't surprise me, but it does seem ridiculous in the middle of an electoral campaign. Spain is set to decide its future for the fourth time in four years at the polls this Sunday, with the Catalan independence movement stronger than ever, and the political shift to the right in Madrid causing great concern. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Until next time. by inequalities, abuse of power, and injustice. The American journalist Abby Martin covers the struggle for fundamental rights worldwide. Deepen into the search of files which uncover the empire's strategies. Through our screen and web platform, in English.